Hi friends, thank you for taking time out of your week to spend a little with me. It is greatly appreciated. This week we're going back to one of the channel specials, The Serial Killer Files. We haven't done one of these in a while, so I think it's time. This case file is on the other Baton Rouge killer, Sean Vincent Gillis. So let's go ahead and dive into this one. Sean Vincent Gillis was born on June 24, 1962 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana to parents Yvonne and Norman Gillis. His father left the home when he was very young due to his alcoholism and mental illness. During one occasion in 1963, Norman held a gun to his head and out of fear of hurting his family, he decided to leave in order to protect them. Norman bounced around from one mental institution to the next and was not an active figure in his son's life. Yvonne took up the responsibility of raising Sean as a single mother with the help of his paternal grandparents. Even though Norman wasn't around, his parents, with Yvonne's help, made it a point to be there for the young boy. Yvonne worked at the local TV station and did everything she could to provide Sean a normal and stable life. Yvonne and Sean had a very close relationship. She doted on him and wanted to make sure Sean had all of the opportunities life had to offer. This included buying a small ranch-style home in a decent area in 1971. It was a quiet, middle-class neighborhood and Yvonne felt like the two could have a good life there. Unfortunately, this move proved to show the difference between Sean and other kids his age. He was ostracized by the neighborhood children due to his odd behaviors. Some of the neighbors described him as a bully and would often have fits of anger for no real reason, while other children said he gave them the willies. A girl from the neighborhood named Carolyn recalled one night she saw Sean outside in his driveway at 3 in the morning banging on trash cans just to be loud and intrusive. Ultimately, he was just described as being a very angry boy, while Yvonne felt her son was just a normal kid. In fact, Yvonne said Sean was usually a well-behaved child. She only used physical punishment on him once in his life. She felt so bad afterwards that she just started grounding him and revoking privileges instead, which apparently didn't happen often. At the behest of Yvonne, Sean was enrolled into a Catholic elementary school because, to her, religion and education were the most important pillars in life. Sean attended Catholic school until the seventh grade, where he transferred to Redemptorist High School. Sean was always an average student with very little friends since he was considered weird, but high school really seemed to drive the wedge between him and his peers. During high school, Sean only had two friends he really considered to be close to him. The trio liked the same music, the same girls, getting high, and the occult, but that fizzled out pretty quickly before graduation. Yvonne wasn't aware of her son's extracurriculars he engaged in when she was away, and for the most part, Sean and his buddies didn't get into any real trouble, just minor infractions as most teens are prone to doing. In 1979, when he was 17 years old, Sean's grandfather passed away, which was a huge blow for him. During the funeral, he met his father for the first time since he was a baby. Norman and Sean took the opportunity to turn grief into something positive by rekindling the relationship. The two started spending more time together, with Norman even attending his graduation ceremony in 1980. However, the reunion was short-lived. During a visit at his father's home, Sean came across a lot of adult material involving men, which made him uncomfortable. He asked Norman about the pictures, and to Sean's surprise, his father was attracted to men, and due to their varying opinions on Norman's lifestyle, Sean decided to cut his father off. Shortly after discovering his father's secret, Sean was arrested for the first time at the age of 18 for trespassing. After graduation, Sean joined the workforce. He gained employment as a 7-Eleven convenience store clerk. 
But this type of work he found to be unfulfilling and lacking. He did try to change locations from one store to another, but just couldn't find joy in his work. He did, however, find joy in the internet, and more specifically, mature content. He enjoyed it so much, he saved enough money to buy a computer for his home, where he spent hours browsing the web. All of his time became consumed, and he started to shrug off responsibilities such as work. He continued to work at 7-Eleven, but decided to pursue a certificate in computer science. He enrolled into a community college where he did complete his program, but it doesn't appear Sean ever did anything with this certification. In 1992, Sean's life took a drastic turn. He was 30 years old at this point, and his mother Yvonne received a job offer in Atlanta, Georgia, which she accepted. She urged her son to tag along and start a new life with her, but he refused to leave. For the first time in his life, Sean was on his own. But Yvonne still supported her son financially, even after her move. Sean started acting more erratically after his mother left. The neighbors despised him living in the neighborhood, and many avoided him because of his weird behaviors. He was seen several times laying on the grass, barking at the moon, and cursing his mother for leaving him behind when the loneliness finally set in. He was also caught several times peeking into neighbors' windows, claiming he was looking for his lost cat. During one of these peeping Tom moments, police were called and Sean was arrested on an outstanding traffic violation, but he was eventually released. Sean got very out of hand, and plainly, his neighbors wanted him gone. But throughout all of his tumultuous behaviors, he did meet a woman named Terry Lamone in 1994 through a friend. Terry and Sean seemed to have a lot in common, so they started seeing each other, but the events of their first date should have been a red flag. After what seemed to be a lovely night spent together, Terry and Sean got into a heated argument which resulted in Terry slapping Sean in the face. The assault made him cry and Terry realized what she'd done, so she apologized profusely and promised that violence would not be a part of their relationship. However, unbeknownst to Terry, that same year, Sean took his first life. On March 21st, 1994, Sean found himself outside the door of 81-year-old Ann Bryan. Ann lived across the street from the convenience store he was working at at the time. On this particular day, she left the door unlocked anticipating her nurse's arrival, but unfortunately, this would be a grave mistake. Sean entered the home and planned to assault the elderly woman, but when she started screaming, he had to act quick. In order to silence her, he cut her throat and stabbed her repeatedly for a total of 47 times. The attack was quick and brutal, and Sean was free and clear. When Anne was discovered, police felt it was a random attack and the perpetrator would be nearly impossible to track down. And he was. For nearly 10 years, Sean lived with his secret, and no one was none the wiser to his heinous actions. After the initial kill, Sean went quiet for several years and didn't take another life. He claimed this period of inactivity was due to happiness. His relationship with Terry was going strong, and the two even made the commitment to move in together. And for once, he was content with his life. That was until he wasn't. It wasn't long before Terry realized she may have made a mistake by moving forward with Sean. Sean didn't give up his addiction to adult websites, and he made no effort to hide it. His addiction started to drive a wedge in their relationship, and at first, Terry did try to overlook it. That was until she got a taste of just how extreme Sean was about it. He would show her pictures of deceased women, which, according to Terry, made her feel uneasy and really upset, but she still chose to stick by his side. For five years, Sean was dormant but then he couldn't resist the thrill any longer. He grew bored with his now mundane life. So on the evening of January 4th, 1999, he drove to an area of town known for shady dealings. He pulled up to the curb where he was greeted by 29-year-old Catherine Hall. Catherine at the time was known to live on and work the streets to help support a drug addiction she developed. 
The two worked out the pricing and Sean gladly paid for her services. So Catherine climbed into the car and the two went to a more secluded area. Once alone, Sean struck. He attempted to strangle her with a zip tie first, but Catherine fought back and tried to flee the attack. Sean, much like the first victim, panicked when he started losing control and just started to stab Catherine to prevent her from getting away. He stabbed her a total of 16 times. Once he knew she was gone, he removed her clothing and assaulted her post-mortem. He then took her body and disposed of her in the Virginia Lake subdivision near Hushu 2 Road, where she was found days later. Sean found his next victim just four months after Catherine. Hardy Schmidt was a 52-year-old woman who Sean became interested in when he saw her out jogging one day. He stalked her for three weeks learning her routine to pinpoint the right moment to attack. And that moment came on May 30th, 1999. Hardy was out on her usual jog when Sean hit her with his car. She was knocked unconscious and landed in a nearby ditch. Sean zip-tied her by the neck and tossed her into his car, then drove her to an isolated area before assaulting, then strangling Hardy. Much like his previous victims, he mutilated her post-mortem. But this time, he did not dispose of her immediately. Instead, he placed Hardy into his trunk for two days. He then dumped her body in the bayou near Highway 61, and she was found soon after. His fourth victim was 36-year-old Joyce Williams, who he hired for services on November 12, 1999. He followed the same formula as Catherine by strangling Joyce with a zip tie, but this time he took her body back to his home. Once there, he started severing body parts and even ate some of her skin. He returned her body back to the car and discarded her on the east side of Iberville Parish. She wasn't discovered until January 2000 when Hunter stumbled upon one of her leg bones in a wooded area along the east bank of the Mississippi River. About 700 feet from this location, the rest of her skeleton was found at a different site. That same month, he picked up 52-year-old Lillian Robinson, who he strangled and took back to his home. However, he was short on time and unable to carry out his usual method. So instead, he assaulted her post-mortem, then dropped her body off in the Atchafalaya Basin along Interstate 10. Her body was discovered on February 10, 2000 by a group of fishermen. Sean took a few months off again before he found victim number six, another working girl named Marilyn Nevels, aged 38. After a visit with his goddaughter, he hired Marilyn and killed her the same way as his previous victims in October of 2000. She was also taken back to his home where allegedly he showered with her body before leaving her on a levee where she wasn't discovered until the following month by a random passerby. Sean then went dormant again for three years, which turned out to be a wise move because at the time of his killings, Another man was terrorizing Baton Rouge. This other killer was a man named Derek Todd Lee. Derek, like Sean, was targeting women in the area without preference. Both men didn't fit the typical box defined by the FBI for serial killers. They didn't have a victim type. This meant race, age, or social class didn't matter to them. Anyone was a target, and that created quite a puzzle for investigators to put together. At the time, police and Sean were unaware of another player involved. In fact, until the number of victims continued to increase after Derek was arrested, police thought there was only one potential suspect because it seemed very unlikely they would have two serial killers at the exact same time in the same location. When the news about a potential serial killer in Baton Rouge made it to the public, Sean was anticipating the reaction until he realized the victims were not his victims. Sean became obsessed with following the work of his competition. He spent more time on the computer learning about Derek's crimes, saving articles, and studying him. He didn't know who Derek was, but he knew he wouldn't be beat, so Sean plotted to begin again. But before he could start, Derek Lee was arrested in May of 2003 and identified as the Baton Rouge killer. 
when his DNA was linked to samples from his last victim. This didn't deter Sean, and he carried on with his plan. He wasn't going to be outdone. His seventh victim was 45-year-old Johnny Mae Williams, who was a mother that turned to the streets in order to provide for her children. And in a weird turn of events, Sean actually knew Johnny. In fact, he referred to her as sort of a friend. He had hired her previous years to help clean up his house, and the two stayed in contact. So Sean picked her up that fateful night in October of 2003, except this time Johnny wouldn't return home. Sean strangled her and removed her hands post-mortem. He decided to keep one of the hands before driving her body to another location and leaving her on an embankment. Her body was discovered days later on October 11th by a group riding four-wheelers off Pride Port Hudson Road near Green Franklin Road. His eighth and final victim was picked up on February 26, 2004. 43-year-old Donna Bennett Johnston lived a high-risk life. She was known to work the streets and to also have an issue with substance abuse. So when her paths crossed with Sean's, she was an easy target for him. She was sadly very intoxicated and really unaware of what was going on. Sean claimed she didn't even fight back. He took her near his home and strangled her like so many before. He then mutilated her post-mortem, removing part of her arm and cutting off her tattoos. He took nearly 50 pictures with her body before posing it in a drainage canal outside of Baton Rouge city limits. She was found the next day. The discovery of Donna, Johnny, and Catherine created concern for investigators. They thought they already had their killer in custody. So in March of 2004, a task force was created in order to investigate the deaths and other similar unsolved homicides. They tried to link as many as they could to Derek, but nothing lined up and the theory of a second serial killer was much more probable than before. While investigating the Johnston crime scene, police noticed fresh tire tracks. It turned out these tracks were made by a unique tire belonging to a Chevrolet Cavalier. So a list of Chevrolet Cavalier owners was generated to help narrow suspects, and Sean was one of them. On April 28, 2004, detectives arrived at Sean's home to question him and collect a DNA swab, which he agreed to. They checked his tires and noticed they matched that unique tread found at the Johnston scene. Plus, something just felt off about him. With the tire impressions being sufficient enough evidence to take him in, Sean was arrested on April 29, 2004 at 1.20 a.m. A SWAT team broke down his door and arrested him in front of Terry, who he could only say sorry to before being carted out of the house. The DNA swab collected was also tested to the known samples from several victims, and they came back as a match. Later that day, he confessed to everything, and a search warrant was issued for his home. Upon searching the house, police recovered a list of items. Trophies he'd taken from his victims, seven saws, several knives, a machete, plastic zip ties, external hard drives, four computers, a computer scanner, photos of Johnny's body, a wooden club, six Playboy pocketbooks, and newspaper clippings on Derek Lee's last victim. During an analysis of the computer, they also discovered horrific movies regarding real-life murders and a documentary on the Manson murders. It seems Sean had a passion for serial killers. Several books, both nonfiction and fiction, were seized as well. Sean Gillis was booked into the East Baton Rouge Parish Prison shortly after. After his arrest, Sean was very open about everything he did, even writing Johnston's friend Tammy about what he'd done to her friend. He stated, quote, Your friend died quickly. She was so far gone that night that I really do not think she even knew what was happening to her. She was so drunk it only took about a minute and a half to succumb to unconsciousness and then death. Honestly, her last words were, I can't breathe, end quote. Sean was even interviewed by the FBI where he explained he was playing a game with everyone. Apparently, he would watch the news and plot his next move based on what police were doing. He thought the whole thing was a game of chess and he was on the winning side. He also explained that it wasn't hard to lure his victims in. A little money and a lot of charm went a long way. 
He explained he paid attention to weather reports to plot out how and where to leave bodies since the rain washed away most evidence. He was cold and seemingly very calculated. Sean was indicted for the murders of Donna Johnston, Joyce Williams, and Catherine Hall. Even though he confessed to all eight murders, they lacked the physical evidence to connect him to those crimes to secure a conviction. His trial began on July 21, 2008, and ultimately he was found guilty of murder and later one count of second-degree murder for Joyce Williams. During the penalty phase, the jury decided against the death penalty, instead sentencing him to multiple life sentences without the possibility of parole. Today, at 59 years old, Sean Gillis remains incarcerated at the Louisiana State Penitentiary in West Feliciana Parish. Sean is remorseful but proud for what he's done. He claims, quote, I'm sorry I hurt people, but I would do it again. You let me out on the street, I'll find somebody before sundown. If anything in my useless life comes out, help the little girls today not be the premature corpses of tomorrow. End quote. What a doozy. Serial killers can be emotionally taxing because they always seem to be so descriptive about how they killed someone, what they did after, etc. I know they do it for attention, but man, like I don't know how many of you have watched the Gacy tapes on Netflix, but I finished it the other day and that was almost too much. I, I know the Gacy case. I've read the lawyer's book a few years ago I mean, I studied it from top to bottom, and just hearing his words lined up with pictures is bone chilling. Like, watching any kind of serial killer interviews is always bone chilling for me because they just, they're like normal people, but they're not. And that's what's scary about it, I guess. I don't know, but I am interested in hearing your thoughts, so share them down below in the comments section and we can chat about it. If you found this to be informative, consider giving it a thumbs up to let YouTube know you want more. And lastly, if you're not subscribed yet, you should because we would love to have you under the ash tree. Thank you all for tuning in and I appreciate each and every one of you. Don't forget how awesome you are and I hope you have an amazing week because you've already made mine. So until next time, I will see you then. Bye friends.